Okay, so we're going to be moving on to the next uh, Don Patterson uh, text, which is the Ferryman's Arms. And um, it's a sort of short text, short poem, which basically uh, looks at the speaker's experience being on a ferry and being on a ferry and basically uh he takes he takes a little bit of time to he takes a bit of time to basically play some pool or snooker i don't know which one but he takes some time to basically play some pool or snooker and it just records his experience doing that and uh his reflections in the, in those kind of moments so he begins about to sit down with my half pint of guinness I was magnetized by a remote phosphorescence, meaning light phosphorescence, and drawn like a moth to the darkened back room where, the, where a pool table hummed to itself in the corner. With ten minutes to kill and the whole place deserted, I took myself on for the hell of it, slotting a coin in the tongue. I looked around for a cue while I stood with my back turned. The balls were deposited. So the first thing to notice with this poem is that it is uh, written in a free verse. There's no rhyme scheme to it. Um, and so it's a more kind of casual type of poem. It's more in line with the um, modern or postmodern type poetry or writing in that it's moving away from... It's it's not the same as sort of classical poetry, which is always very structured and very... Um, it's very, very structured, very laid out. Like there's certain things you have to do, certain rhythms you have to maintain, certain patterns of rhymes you have to maintain. So um, the po modern, postmodern type writing, it kind of leaves that behind and it's more like uh, there are no structures, there are no um, right ways of doing things. And uh, the reason that this kind of uh, writing came about was basically post War, post war, I think it's World War One, yeah, that the post modern, modern um, period really started. It could be post, it could be World War Two. I think it's one, yeah, I don't think it's two, I think it's one. And um, the reason, the reason why this all sort of really kicked off uh, in a big way, at least in terms of like literature, was that after the war, people were really shaken up, and so a lot of their, you know, ideas in terms of what was what what was the right way of living, the right way of behaving, the right... All of that was kind of shaken up because uh, a lot of people thought that they were living correctly, that they were living, you know, in, in, in the right way. Uh, remember, this is coming right off the back of the, you know, Victorian period in the 1800s. We could also say the modern period, uh, which would be 19, so on, so on, so on. Early 19, late 18, early 19, something like that. Um where people are experimenting with the ideas of like uh, uh, occultism, magic, and science fiction, those kind of things. Those are being like the modern kind of, like the crystal egg or those kind of things. Uh, but in any case, the point is, uh, if you think about think about your life as a Victorian age person in the in the eighteen hundreds, and um, you know, there's very strict rules for how you should act, how you should behave, how you should live, what's right, what's wrong. It's all very clear and laid out. And so you've been living this way, you've been living this way, and then all of a sudden you have World War One, where now your country is being bombed, and now you are now you are at war. Was Britain bombed in World War One? Okay, I don't know. I'm not a historian yet. I don't know the specifics. But let's just say, now you're losing family. Your brothers are dying in France. Your brothers are dying. In, uh, your father, your uncles, cousins are dying all around the world, and. You maybe you're dying. Uh, you're gonna die. Uh, it's terrible. You're you're being attacked by gas and different things, like poisonous gas and different things. And so, but you were living the correct way, right? You were living the the good Christian way. You were living according to the way that the government and uh, different structures in your life had told you was the correct way to live. And so you were expecting as a as a reward for that good living that you would be rewarded with a good life, a safe life, and all that. And then here comes World War One and shatters all of your ideas about life and, and reality. And that's how you essentially you get the, the postmodern movement where they basically say that there are no right or wrong. There is no right and wrong. There is no uh, set structures of 
good and bad. There are no, you know, proper ways to behave or live or do anything. Uh, there just is a big absurd mess. There's just a big uh thing, a big there's just there's just a big mess, basically, if you like. I wouldn't even say that they say that there is reality because they they don't define anything that there is there is no sense there is essentially there's no definition um there's just stuff basically and it's not good it's not bad it's just there and it's also kind of pointless as well it's a very negative kind of view so anyway the point my the point i was making is that this is how you get free verse and uh, uh it's one of it's one it's one of those uh it's a style that comes out of this kind of um background and backdrop so anyway, he's saying, I took myself on for the hell of it, slotting a cow in the tongue. I looked for a round for a cue while I stood on my back, turned the balls were deposited with abrupt intestinal rumble, a strip plate batted awake, and it's dusty even cow. Another thing with these, um, with the sort of postmodern type of writing, is that oftentimes it will just be about very simple, mundane, random type of things. And uh, oftentimes there's not really even like a story to it. It's just like describing something um at length basically um so anyway he goes into the room and there's a pool table there and uh he's got some time to call i don't know if he's you know why if the boat's about to take off or he's waiting for his boat or something i'm not sure now um, in any case he goes to the pool table and he uh he sets up the table yeah basically that's how he sets up the table okay all right when i set down the cue ball inside the parched d it clacked some onomatopoeia there clacked on the state on slate onomatopoeia obviously just means the when the word sounds like the way it it sounds it's read the way that it sounds clack like that like you have a ball with another ball it makes that clack sound which is the same as the way the word is read the nap was so thread bare meaning thin i could screw back the globe given somewhere to stand I could screw back the globe. This is a reference to the quote by, I believe it's Archimedes. Could be wrong. I believe it's Archimedes who says, give me somewhere to stand and I'll move the earth. I believe it's Archimedes. Uh, one of the founders of Leverage. Let me see. Give me it's Archimedes. Give me somewhere to stand and I'll move the world. Give me somewhere. Just... Ah, it's Archimedes. Give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. It's a reference to that. It's a quote by Archimedes, Greek uh, mathematician, philosopher, physicist, um, who discovered many of the principles of leverage. Um, anyway, I could screw back the globe given somewhere to stand. As physics itself becomes something negotiable, a rash of small miracles covers the shortfall. I went on to make an immaculate clearance. So he's just talking about basically putting the ball into the, no, putting, <laughs> putting the ball into the into the pocket of the pool table. Uh, I went on to make an immaculate clearance, a low punch with a wee dab of side, and the black did the vanishing trick while the white stopped before gently rolling back as if nothing had happened. So he potted he potted the the ball, shouldering its way through the unpotted colors. Again, it's kind of why would you write a poem about this? It's kind of why would you write a poem about this? It's such a, it's such a simple thing that doesn't really deserve a poem to be written about it. Um. And again, you could you could look at it, you could look at it from if you if you're carrying on the thoughts that I laid out before, uh, from the again postmodern type of perspective in that, uh, everything from the postmodern lens is seen as the same. Everything in the postmodern lens is the same. So someone playing pool at, 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 in a random place is the same in terms of its importance or in terms of its weight as, you know, the most uh, experienced physicist doing the most complicated physics experiment to save humanity. Like, they're the same in the postmodern lens. And the reason for that is because the in the postmodern perspective, Nothing has any importance or nothing has any meaning. Everything is essentially the same, basically, because everything is essentially random and um everything is essentially uh when you when you boil it down to its sort of foundation, uh, everything is essentially without meaning and without real definition. And um 
uh, this postmodern perspective is actually, you'd be surprised, you know, you might think it's got nothing to do with uh, today or your life. Uh, but this postmodern perspective is actually uh, greatly informed our, you know, a lot of how we kind of think about things today or a lot of what's in our in our modern culture in terms of, for example, the trans, excuse me, the trans movement or, uh, you know, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, uh, what it means to, uh, you know, what it means to uh, be anything really. You know, identity itself um, has has definitely been affected by this uh, postmodern thinking. And the reason is, it's because um, th there was a popular film uh, a few years ago done by Matt Walsh, which talked, he went around and asked people, what is it, you know, what's a woman? Um, see, the thing, the thing with uh, this question, the reason why no one, no one answered it, it's because uh, the people who he, who he was asking essentially are coming from the postmodern perspective in that uh, they don't have a clear definition of anything essentially and so uh, and the reason they don't have a clear definition of anything is if i want to be if i want to be if i want to be what's the word charitable kind if i want to be sort of uh optimistic or something if i want to be on their side it's because they want to they don't want to exclude any kind of they don't want to exclude anyone's experience or anyone's identity, anyone's beliefs about themselves. They want to keep all doors open and so everyone can be included and everyone can essentially be represented and feel validated. That's if I want to be like sort of charitable or if I want to be, uh, you know, saying that they're not like, that they're nice people or something. Um, but if you want to take the other way, it's um, if you want to be more critical, um, a reason a lot of people uh, don't take any clear definitions is because, uh, well, if you wanted to be very critical, you could say that if they took a clear definition, then they would, there would be certain things that they might have to change about themselves or that they may have to, you know, certain actions they may have to take, which they might not want to take. Certain truths would be revealed that they might not want to accept or they might not want to be sort of held by something like that. Uh, so uh, why why do we need definitions? Uh, why, why are definitions important? Or even why are they useful? Why do we define things? So what is a definition to begin with? Um, a definition is essentially like a box. Okay, imagine a definition is a box. And um, let me think about it. Let me show you. Okay, so imagine a definition is a box. Okay, this is a definition. Everything, everything inside this box is the thing that we are defining. Okay. Now, everything outside of this box. Everything outside of this box is not the thing that we are defining. So for example, carrying on like what I'm talking about, if we say that a woman is X, this, then it means that everything outside of this box is not a woman, basically. Or if we say a man is this, and we give it a definition, then it means everything outside of this box is not a man, essentially. Now, why do we do this? Uh, naturally, this is a human thing to do. It. It's it's very natural for human beings to define things and, and to categorize things like this, to give them definitions. We do this because um, there's a problem. There's a problem that happens when you don't have definitions for things, or when you when you when you basically start to erase parts of the definition. When you uh, erase the lines, essentially. Uh, when you get rid of the lines, what you can see is, well, what happens is the thing that we said was a woman. So we erase the lines, we get rid of the definition. Now, look at this. Huh? Everything can be and anything can be a woman. Understand? You get this, basically, like this. And this is a problem because we can't live in a world like this. You understand? I don't mean that we should or we shouldn't. I mean that we can't. It's not like... 
if you want to if you want to in order to exist and to be able to to operate in the world what we need is we need to be able to understand where we are uh, in terms of who we are what we are etc and then where it is that we want to go in terms of like what that is where that is what that's like and all that and so essentially what that means is we need essential we need sort of definitions for things uh, which allow us to exist and to to operate in the world to live basically it's very hard to live in a world without any definitions uh, if everything is a mess like that like that chaos thing it's hard to exist which is why we do this like we say like this is me okay and this is where i'd like to go this is where i'd like to be and so it's this is easy and this is called like movement this is like life you can go like this you can go like that okay now but what's the problem what's the problem with having definitions what's the problem the problem is and this is what people who are more uh like liberal thinking or more on the uh what you might call like the left or more like the um what do you might call it more uh huh, liberal thinking is that well if you have a definition Okay, like this. If you have a definition and you say that a woman is this, this thing, like this, then, and you say, therefore, a woman is not these things out here, well, it means by de by definition, you exclude, essentially, you exclude everything outside. Do you understand? You exclude all of this. Now, obviously, that means we can keep the definition, yes, but at the same time, it means that you are essentially excluding you you are excluding people and you are excluding things that uh that do exist in other words you are excluding uh well in this case it would be people who would like to be considered a woman you're excluding them and you're saying that no you you're not you can't be part of this thing which might be fine if you're talking about like what a woman is or what a man is you might say okay that's fine that's acceptable but then you might run into problems if you uh if you have other things like for example for example, with uh, some politicians talking about like how what is British or what is not British or what is like American, what's not American, and then this becomes ha a very, very dangerous thing. You understand? Because now you start to start to exclude people and you start to see them as the enemy, as the enemy, and so that's why people who are more like liberal thinking, what they say is fine you have a definition fine okay but the thing with your definition is it's not big enough your definition is too small and that's why they might call it backwards or small-minded or something like that and so what you need to do is you need to take your definition and you need to open it up you need to extend it like this i need to make it bigger let me change this you need to make your definition bigger okay so it includes more people like this, like a woman is not just one thing, but it's like this thing, it's like that thing. A woman is not just someone who has children and, you know, uh, what do you call it, stays home all day and who accepts when her husband beats her and who uh, has no identity or no dreams or no autonomy of her own. She exists just to serve her husband and her family. No, a woman, you extend it open anymore. A woman is someone who has personal autonomy, bodily autonomy. She she doesn't need to have kids. If she doesn't want to have kids, she can go and work. She can, um, she's not just subservient to whoever she's married to, but she's an equal. So he can't just push her around or tell her what to do, but he should, she should have voluntary consent in terms of what she does. Uh, he can't, for example, take uh, rape as a thing, that, you know, we have to look into a bit more closely like this, huh? So you extend the definition in order to make it better, basically, in order to make it better. So essentially what what's what happens between, you know, uh, politically speaking, what happens or it, this is always, I think, being the case, huh? even for, so philosophically speaking, is that you always have a kind of like, um, kind of like a debate or ongoing interaction, if you like, between people who are more, uh let's keep what we have you know let's keep what we have and let's basically uh preserve things as they are protect people and the open mind 
I don't want to say open minded because that makes other people sound closed minded. The um the let's let's change things, let's make things more diverse, let's open the definitions a bit more, let's broaden things, let's include more people, type people, basically. You always have a sort of different kinds of people. Um and the point is that we should talk and we should sort of um be able to uh use our natural you know gifts and inclinations in order to try and make things better and push things forward that would be like the ideal um so anyway <laughs> anyway anyway i'm talking about all this because the poem is about the guy playing pool yeah so <laughs> ah i got to here because i was talking about uh why why is he why is he making the poem yeah because basically from the postmodern perspective everything's the same pretty much nothing has any um nothing has any clear definition so they're more on the on the, like the liberal type side right which is why essentially it's mostly liberals that would support the idea of like uh people being trans or people women entering the workforce and all that those that's all from like the more liberal type of side and the more uh conservative in terms of like holding on traditional maybe or the more traditional would be like the opposite of that let's keep the definitions tight and all that okay anyway so the point is him focusing on playing pool which is like who cares about playing pool yeah it's like a you don't need to write this poem yet but the point is it fits perfectly with the with the liberal postmodern type thinking it fits because it's like nothing is more important than anything else yet that's why okay the boat chugged up to the little stone jetty Without breaking the skin of the water, stretching as black as my stout from somewhere unspeakable to here. It's a nice way of describing the boat. Where the foaming lip musitates endlessly, muttering, that means that, whispering, T tying with the nutter's persistence to, trying with the nutter's persistence to read and reread the shoreline. Okay, I got aboard early, remembering the ferry would leave on the hour, even for only my losing opponent. But I left him there stuck in his tent of light, suddenly knocking the balls in for practice for next time. Basically, just uh, the boat arrives and huh, the boat arrives. And it's hard for me to tell whether he was playing pool on the boat or whether he was waiting for the boat and he's about to go on now. In any case, he was playing pool. Either the boat arrived and he's about to get on or he's getting off. And so anyway, he's leaving the pool behind and it's just his opponent sort of still there. Um... And that's the poem, yeah, basically. It's a, it's just he played pool and then he left. That's the poem. <laughs> Excuse me. And again, it just it's very reminiscent to me of other kind of other kind of like modern slash postmodern type writing where they don't they just focus on very like mundane things, things which are not really that you wouldn't think that they're that important. They're not really meaningful. They're just like, you know, uh like one 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 thing I bring up quick one example I bring up I brought before is Crap's last tape. He's just sitting in a in a darkened stage by himself, you know, talking. Um, another example would be some of the um, what's her name? Ah, uh, what's her name? What's her name? Ah, uh, what's her name? I forget. There's a there's a woman. Uh, she's one of the she's one of the premier um. Virginia Woolf, that's I think that's her name. Virginia Virginia Woolf, she's one of the main modern modernist type uh, writers, and she has a story, a short story, where she just basically talks about one day where she's just talking about. She's essentially it's just a it's a stream of thought type story, and it's just talking about how she met somebody. It's like it's like pointless now. She just met somebody, gave her flowers or something like that. Yeah, it's like very kind of mundane. Nothing big happens yet, basically. So this is the same kind of thing. It's just about uh, the same kind of idea, uh, focusing on the mundane and the the normal, and um, uh, essentially sort of capturing some of those ideas and thoughts which I which I laid out. 